Hello. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, this evening uh, Alberto Pamso uh, from uh, Warwick University. Uh, Alberto mm, is working on uh, Kant and uh, on uh, experimental philosophy uh, going roughly from the early modern period up to Kant. Uh, today he is going to talk about Leibniz on innate ideas and Kant on the origin of categories. Alberto, you have the floor. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It is a pleasure to be here. This paper is part of a larger project in which I try to make sense of uh, Kant's theory of concepts. And I try to see whether it is able to withstand a number of objections that have been advanced against abstractionist theories of concept formation, which is the outlook on concept, concept formation that I think Kant has. And in the uh, course of this research, I have um, come across Kant's statements on Leibniz's innatism and his very explicit claim that there are no innate concepts. Uh, what I try to do in this paper is to argue that actually um, Kant's ideas about uh, innate concepts are not that different from Leibniz's ideas, and that when Kant claims that there are no innate ideas, um, that is a claim that we cannot uh, take at face value. Uh, the most uh, well-known place where Kant claims that there are no innate concepts is in the work against Eberhardt uh, on the discovery, and it is the first passage that you can find in the handout. Quote, the critic admits absolutely no implanted or innate representations, one and all, whether they belong to intuition or to concepts of understanding, it considers them as acquired." End quote. And then, uh, slightly later, Kant goes on to point out that, in particular, quote, universal transcendental concepts of the understanding, i.e. categories, are acquired and not innate. Now, a number of Kant scholars take these statements at face value. So they hold that Kant did not endorse concept innatism, that the categories are not innate concepts, and that Kant's views on innateness are significantly different from Leibniz's views. Uh, on the other hand, in this paper, I intend to argue that Kant's views on the origin of the intellectual concepts are very similar to Leibniz's, remarkably similar, in fact, especially in light of the fact that Kant distances his views from Leibniz's. And I will also argue that even to widespread notions of innateness, which are the dispositional notion and the input-output notion, intellectual concepts are innate both for Kant and for Leibniz. I have used the expression intellectual concepts that I will apply both to Kant and to Leibniz. So let me clarify what I mean with that expression. When I use the expression intellectual concepts with regard to Leibniz, I refer to those that the new essays call the intellectual ideas or the ideas of reflection. And they are the ideas that, according to Leibniz, we should regard as innate, even if we accepted people's common framework, common way of thinking, and we felt that some mental concepts derive from the interaction, causal interaction with material. Uh, so Leibniz claims that, uh, of course, there is no causal interaction between the material and the mental world, but even if there were uh, that kind of interaction, we should still claim that a certain set of concepts, intellectual concepts, do not derive from our interaction with the material world. And there are concepts like those of unity, <coughs> existence, cause, possibility, action, and virtue. Now, given Kant's views, all concepts can be said to be intellectual concepts because Kant claims that the faculty that generates all concepts is the understanding, is the intellect. And the intellect does this, according to Kant, by conferring conceptual form 
of non-conceptual representations. Even if, in that sense, all concepts are intellectual for Kant. Uh, for the purpose of this paper, when I use the, the expression intellectual concepts with regard to Kant, I refer to those concepts that Kant classes as being given a priori. And there are concepts like unity, substance, cause, possibility, action, and virtue. So we see that there is at least some overlap among Kant's and Leibniz's lists of intellectual concepts. Now, given Kant's views, these concepts are intellectual par excellence because the intellect provides not just their form, as it does with all concepts, but also their matter, their content. Uh, as I will explain, uh, the content of intellectual concepts, according to Kant, derives from the acts of reflection that the intellect carries out on the other acts, the acts that it performs in the course of experience. So we have the mental acts that we normally carry out when we have experiences, and then we have a second set, a second order of mental acts, acts of reflection, so those acts, those first acts, and these are the acts that generate intellectual concepts. Uh, my paper is divided in three sections. I will start by outlining Kant's views on how we form the intellectual concepts. And I will focus on the formation of the categories because, well, first of all, there are Kant's paradigmatic example of intellectual concepts, but also they are the only kind of intellectual concepts for which Kant makes some relatively explicit remarks on how they are generated. I will then compare Kant's and Leibniz's views on the formation of intellectual concepts in order to establish the two claims that I mentioned earlier, that there is a substantial agreement between Kant's and Leibniz's views on the origin of intellectual concepts, and that given those two notions of innateness, the dispositional notion and the input-output notion, intellectual concepts turn out to be innate both for Kant and for Leibniz. Uh, in the third and last section of the paper, we will then dispel an objection against these claims. And the objection is this. Kant pretty explicitly provides three arguments against concept innatism. But then surely if he argues against innatism, he can't be an innatist himself. And in response to this objection, I will survey Kant's arguments concerning concept innatism, and I will argue that they are actually compatible with Kant's specific form of innatism, and they target a different kind of innatism, Christian August Crusus's reformationism. Okay, I'll now start with the first section of my paper in which I provide an outline of Kant's views on the origin of the categories, the paradigmatic case of intellectual concepts. Kant writes that categories, like all cognitions, quote, are acquired and not innate, end quote. They are formed, quote, on the occasion of experience. For on occasion of experience and the senses, the understanding forms concepts which are not from the senses. And then, uh, a bit later, Kant goes on to, to write, we practice this action as soon as we have impressions of the senses. Now, this action, the action with which we form our categories, does not depend on our choice to form them. And this is because Kant classes the categories as given concepts. And a concept is given, Kant writes, insofar as it does not arise from my faculty of choice, my will. So we don't form the categories because we want to form them, but we form them because we have a natural tendency or disposition to form them. Uh, Kant writes that the actualization of this tendency takes place as soon as we have impressions of the senses. So the actualization of the tendency is prompted by sensible representations. And so Kant can claim that the categories, like all cognitions, commands with experience. But he holds that the categories, unlike empirical concepts, do not arise from experience. Uh, in fact, Kant classes the categories as, as concepts that are, yes, 
even, but they are given a priori. And this means that they are content, does not derive from sensations or from empirical intuition, from the matter of the experience. So what does the content of the categories derive from if it doesn't derive from sensations, from sensory impressions? Kant starts from the 70s, from the decade before he published the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, often state that we form the categories by abstraction. And occasionally, they also mention a reflection. They state, for instance, that the categories are, quote, abstract concepts, here we find abstraction, of reflection, end quote. So as a consequence, the content of the categories must derive from that on which we carry out those acts of abstraction and of reflection. And what the categories are abstracted from are these are both quotes from passages from the 1770s. The laws of reason on occasion of experience, the laws inherent to the mind, the laws of our thinking, or the laws according to which the understanding compares, unites, and separates abstract concepts." End quote. Now, the critique of purism flashes out this suggestion by explaining that each category derives from the logical laws that define a certain form of judgment. So we have the table of the forms of judgment and the table of the categories, and each category derived from a form of judgment. And later on, in texts from the 90s, like the work against Eberhardt that I quoted at the beginning of my paper, Kant fleshes out this suggestion, or at least he provides references to what he calls the original acquisition of the categories that fit very easily within this picture. Um, on my mind, these references to the original acquisition are references to the genesis of the categories on the basis of these acts of reflection of the various kinds of forms of judgment. Let me provide an example in order to clarify a little bit how this process might unfold. Let's take the category of substance. Uh, we have experience, and on occasion of experience, our senses gather information and they pass it on to the understanding, to the intellect. The understanding is what can cause the faculty of fools. Uh, it has a natural, pro natural propensity to reflect on the information that it receives from the senses in order to seek rules or to seek regularities. Kant writes in um, the first edition of the first critique that the understanding, quote, is always busy pouring through the appearances with the aim of finding some sort of rule in that, end quote. Now, the act with which the understanding six rules reflects on the information provided by the senses must be acts of judgment, correct? Acts similar to judgments because, quote, we can trace all actions of the understanding back to judgments, end quote. Now, we have sensory information which is given to the understanding. We have acts of judgment with which the understanding seeks regularity and we are conscious of those very acts of judgment. Here we have that second level, that second order of click fraction that I mentioned earlier. And we spontaneously apply our tendency to seek regularities to those very acts of judgment. And by doing this, we will notice, for instance, that several of our judgments have a subject predicate form because they are categorical judgments. So they ascribe predicates to certain subjects. And our understanding includes the capacity to abstract, to selectively divert attention from the features that differentiates various acts of judgments, and to focus on what they have in common, which is the logical form. So we reflect on the form of categorical judgments, of judgments of a subject predicate form, and uh, we notice that or rather we give, rise, we, we give rise to the concept of something that exists only as a subject, but not as a predicate. So a bearer of attributes that is not itself the, that cannot itself be attributed to anything else. And this, uh, 
something that can exist only as a subject, as a bearer of attributes, but not as an attribute itself. This is Kant's concept of substance. It is what Kant scholars call the unschematized category of substance. So this concept derives from reflections that we carry out on occasion of experience. Hence, it, its origin commences with experience, as Kant claims all cognitions have origin. But the content of our experience is irrelevant for the formation of the category of substance. No matter what experience we, we have, any experience will induce our mind to form judgments of the subject predicate form, and by reflecting on them, we will form the concept of substance. And this explains why, according to Kant, we all share the same concept of substance, even if we have different experiences, even if we have had different sensory impressions in the course of our lives. Now, you could raise scores of objections against this account of the acquisition of the categories. And for the purpose of this paper, I don't need you to agree that the account of the formation of the categories, and in particular of the category of substance that I have sketched, is a tenable account or that it is plausible. I only need you to agree that this is the account that is at least suggested by Kant's studies. Now, uh, I think that there is quite strong textual evidence for abscribing this views to Kant, but um, don't hesitate to challenge this in the discussion if you're not convinced. Okay, having sketched an outline of how, on my reading, the categories the pragmatic case of intellectual concepts are formed according to Kant. I will now move to the second section of my paper, and I will compare the account of the formation of an intellectual concepts that I ascribe to Kant with Leibniz's views on the formation of the ideas of reflection of the intellectual concepts. And I will uh, argue that there is a substantive similarity between Kant's and Leibniz's views by highlighting four points of agreement between Kant and Leibniz. The first point is that both Leibniz and Kant hold that the intellectual concepts are dispositionally innate. I call a concept dispositionally innate if and only if, since our birth, we have a disposition to come to entertain that concept under appropriate circumstances. Now, by we, I mean humans. And I take it that concepts are components of our judgments. And so we come to entertain a concept when we have a thought, when we make a mental judgment, which is partly composed of that concept. OK, let's start with Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz holds that the intellectual concepts, concepts like substance and unity, are dispositionally innate. And this is pretty, pretty uncontroversial. It is borne out, for instance, by a famous line in the preface of the new essay, which I have placed at page two of the handout. Quote, this is how ideas and truths are innate in us, as inclinations, dispositions, tendencies, or natural potentialities, and not as actions. So, Ideas are dispositionally innate. They are innate in us as dispositions, not as actions. Now, uh, let's move to Kant. As for Kant, the dispositional innateness of the intellectual concepts follows from the research of the work against Eberhard. Uh, this too is in the handout. Quote, there must indeed be a ground for it in the subject, however, which makes it possible that these representations, uh, Kant is speaking of the representations of space and time, and what interests me the most of the representations of the categories, can arise in this and no other manner, and be related to objects which are not yet given. And this ground, at least, is innate. So what is this innate ground? It must be an innate faculty or capacity because one of Kant's lecture transcripts 
the metaphysic von Schoen states that, quote, within philosophy, we cannot admit any innate cognitions at all, but only innate faculties and capacities. So, Kant states in the work against Eberhard that there is an innate ground for the categories, and the only innate kind of innate ground that Kant admits are innate faculties or innate capacities. So, um, we have an innate ground, an innate capacity to form the categories. But if we have an involved capacity to form the categories, then the categories are disposition innate. You might also recall a passage from the first critique where Kant writes that the seeds and predispositions of the categories, the Kainen und Anlagen, lie already in the human understanding until with the opportunity of experience, they are finally developed and exhibited in their clarity by the very same understanding. Now, this passage too, by means of a biological metaphor, the metaphor of the seeds and the predisposition, seems to suggest that we have an inborn predisposition to form the categories, the seed of the categories, and hence that the categories are dispositionally made. But um, the problem is that this passage hints at the biological doctrine of formation, and that Kant's attitude to this doctrine is very ambivalent. So sometimes Kant, Kant uh, makes statements which suggest that he is a performationalist. Other times he seems to suggest that he supports the doctrine of epigenesis. And I will not even start to attempt to sort out these passages and to try to provide a single unitary account of Kant's views on um, biological doctrine and how he applies to the understanding. So all I want to say is that this metaphors of the seeds and the predispositions of the, of the categories at least provide some kind of prima facie evidence, some suggestion in favor of the view that the categories are dispositionally innate. And if you want me to expand on the seeds and the predispositions, I'm happy to do that in the questions and answers. Now, I have ascribed a dispositional imitation to Kant who writes that he's not an innatist. So how could he reply to my suggestion? Well, perhaps he could say that the dispositional innateness is not really innateness of a concept. It is only the innateness of a capacity. He could say it is misleading to say that the categories are dispositionally innate. We should say that all that is really innate are our capacity to form and to entertain the categories, not the categories themselves. And this view is in line with the statements of the metaphysical from von Schoen that I mentioned earlier, according to which all that is truly innate are faculties and capacities. Now, of course, I agree that uh, for Kant, as for Leibniz, those faculties and capacities are innate. It is also correct to say that the dispositional innateness of the categories is at most a derivative form of innateness. It depends on the innateness of those capacity, capacities and faculties uh, from which the categories are formed. Um, but it doesn't follow from the fact that the innateness of Even if it is, let me rephrase this, even if it is correct to claim that the dispositional uh, innateness of our concepts depends on a more basic innateness, which is the innateness of our faculties and capacities, it doesn't follow that the dispositional innateness of our concepts is not an authentic, a real form of innateness. It only follows that it is at most a derivative kind of innateness. So why could, uh, we think that Kant did not regard the dispositional innateness of the categories as an authentic form of innateness. Well, maybe Kant had uh, Locke's arguments in mind. It is well known that Locke thought that dispositional innateness 
trivializes the doctrine of innate ideas. So in Locke's view, saying that an idea is dispositionally innate only means to say that we have a capacity to form that idea. But if all that there is to innateness is having a capacity to form an idea, then all of our ideas will automatically be innate because precisely for the fact that we have those ideas, we have the capacity to form that idea. But then the very notion of innateness is trivial. Saying that we have an innate idea just means to say that we have an idea. Uh, now, Leibniz replies to this objection in a new essay. And he replies that the dispositional theory of innateness is not trivial because our mind is differentially predisposed to form certain ideas but not others. So we have the uh, ideas of reflection, those of unity, substance, virtue, that our mind is differentially disposed to form, and not all the other ideas. And this is exactly what Kant thinks. So Kant thinks that we have a differential disposition to entertain the categories and not empirical concepts. Uh, so in Kant's views, we may or we may not entertain any given empirical concept. We might entertain the empirical concept of gyra if we have heard about gyra, so if we have seen one. Or we might not entertain it if we never heard or saw gyra. But we will definitely entertain the categories if we entertain any concept at all. So this can be gathered from Kant's claim that the categories, unlike empirical concepts, are necessary conditions for experience, for any form of experience. And it is reinforced by Kant's statement in the work against Eberhardt that the acquisition of empirical concepts, quote, already presupposes universal transcendental concepts of the understanding. So no matter what con empirical concepts we acquire, in order to acquire any given empirical concepts, we must already have the category. So I conclude by claiming that not only are the intellectual concepts dispositionally made for Kant as they are for Leibniz, but also Kant could use the very same argument that Leibniz employed against Locke in order to claim to deny that dispositional innateness is a trivial form of innateness. It's not trivial because we have a differential disposition to acquire the categories, but not to acquire other kinds of concepts. Okay, so, so far I have argued that there is one significant point of agreement between Kant and Leibniz, which is that for both of them, the innate, the intellectual concepts are dispositionally innate. The second point of agreement between Leibniz and Kant is that, according to both, what triggers or occasions the actualization of the relevant dispositions is experience. Um, I quoted earlier passages from Kant's lectures that mention that we form the categories on occasion of experience. And this is in line with Kant's statement, his famous statement at the beginning of the first critique that all our cognition begin with experience. Um, a passage in Kant's lecture transcripts even claims that in order to have the concept of cause, which is a category, we need to perceive causes in the course of experience. Now, this sounds surprising and possibly a bit misleading, so I will not dwell on that specific passage, but I think the textual evidence for the claim that it is experience that triggers the actualization of the dispositions that he does to entertain the categories is pretty clear cut. <coughs> and the same applies to the textual evidence in Leibniz's case. Leibniz's two thought that um, what actualizes our disposition to entertain intellectual concepts is experience. So he states, for instance, that even though the intellectual ideas are in eighty minds, nevertheless, quote, without the senses, we would never think of them, end quote. So the first point, both Kant and Leibniz are dispositional innatists. The second point, for both of them, what uh, actualizes the relevant dispositions is experience. The third point of agreement between Kant and Leibniz concerns 
the process through which the relevant disposition are actualized. Um, now, neither Leibniz nor Kant provide many details on how this process unfolds, so there is a bit of reconstruction going on here. But they both state that this process is a process of reflection and it, it involves attention. Now, Leibniz calls intellectual ideas ideas of reflection. And he states, for instance, in the New Essays, quote, that reflection suffices to discover the idea of substance within ourselves. And substance is an intellectual idea. Now, Kant might perhaps deny that reflection suffices to discover the concept of substance, but he does agree that we agree with that we need to reflect if we are to come to entertain the concept of substance. He even calls the categories abstract concepts of reflection, and he often states that the formation of any concept whatsoever requires reflection. Now, you might reply that the fact that both Leibniz and Kant use the term reflection is not really that significant. Maybe they didn't have the same mental process in mind. After all, the term reflection we use in all sorts of possible ways in the early modern time. And even Kant uses it in at least three or four different ways in his works. So perhaps they were both using the term reflection, but they had different mental operations in mind. Now, uh, I think that even though I agree that reflection is a very ambiguous term, there are two reasons to think that Leibniz's and Kant's notions of reflection are, or the kind of reflection that is involved in this context, in concept of formation, are if not entirely identical, at least very similar to one another. Now, first of all, I mentioned earlier that both for Kant and Leibniz, what triggers the actualization of the categories is experience. And so uh, the reflection in question has the same trigger, the same input, experience. And it also leads to the same result, to the same out output, which is the formation of the categories. And so this uh, indicates that the notions of reflection of Kant and Leibniz are functionally equivalent. They designate processes that play the same roles in our mental life. They take us from experience to the categories. And uh, the second point is that Leibniz as well as Kant uh, state that the kind of reflection which is involved in the formation of intellectual concepts involves the very same capacity, which is attention. Uh, so when Leibniz discusses the innateness of intellectual ideas, he explains that, quote, reflection is nothing but attention what is within us, end quote. And Kant's text too, at least at the time, used attention in connection with reflection. So for instance, when Kant lists the mental operation that we must carry out in order to form concepts, he usually claims that they are comparison, reflection, and abstraction. But other times, he writes that they are comparison, attention, and abstraction. So he uses attention and reflection in interchangeable ways at least at times. So, um, so far I have argued that both for Kant and for Leibniz, the intellectual ideas are intellectually in a, uh, dispositionally innate, that the process that lead to their formation is triggered to their experience, and that it's a, it is a process of reflection where the kind of reflection at stake is more or less the same kind of process for Kant and for Leibniz. There is one fourth and last point of agreement between Kant and Leibniz that I would like to highlight, and it concerns the relation between sensory stimuli on the one hand and the intellectual concepts on the other. Leibniz and Kant agree that even though those acts of reflection and attention, whereby the relevant dispositions are actualized are triggered, they are occasioned by sensory stimuli. Nevertheless, the content of intellectual concepts does not derive from those stimuli. That concept is contributed by the mind. And this is the sense in which uh, ideas, <coughs> beliefs, conceptual structures, mental representations, all sorts of things are innate 
according to many contemporary authors, such as the authors that are influenced by Chomsky. I call this notion of innateness the input-output notion of innateness. So these authors, authors call an idea, a concept of structure, a representation innate, if and only if, even though its acquisition might have been triggered by the experience, nevertheless, its content does not derive from sensory stimuli. It is contributed by the mind itself. So the idea is that experience sets in motion a process that leads to the formation of certain mental contents. But in the course of that process, it is the mind itself that provides a, cons a content for those concepts that fleshes out that concept um, without deriving that concept from experience. Now, uh, let's start from learning. Our intellectual ideas innate in the input output, output sense for learning is its content contributed by the mind rather than by the experience that occasions or triggers the process of that formation. Well, Leibniz derives, denies mind-body interaction. So he claims that no idea, not even sensory ones, owe their content so to the stimulation of our sense organs. Our ideas are formed through a process that is parallel to body, bodily process, but there is no interaction between the physical and the mental according to life. Uh, so this applies to all concepts, all ideas, but uh, Leibniz emphasizes it even more for the intellectual concepts. Uh, he states time and time again that they are derived from our mind. Um, he, in fact, he claims that we should take the intellectual concepts to derive from our mind rather than from experience, even if the common framework, the common way of thinking were true, and even if we were uh, forced to admit that all other concepts derive from the causal stimulation of our sense organs. So uh, there's no doubt that for Leibniz, the intellectual concepts or ideas are innate in this input-output sense. What about Kant? Well, Kant too is at pains to stress that intellectual concepts, concepts like that of course, cannot have an empirical origin. For instance, he writes in the first critique that, um, quote, it is the quote in the first, fourth paragraph at page three of the handout. All attempts to derive these pure concepts of the understanding from experience, and so to ascribe to them a merely empirical origin, are entirely useless and vain. I need not insist upon the fact that, but actually what he's doing is precisely insist, insisting upon the fact that, for instance, the concept of cause involves the character of necessity, which no experience can be Okay, so I have highlighted four points of agreement between Kant's and Leibniz's views on the origin of our intellectual ideas. Uh, I have also argued along the way that given the dispositional notion and the input-output notion of innateness, Kant, no less than Leibniz, turns out to be an innatist concerning intellectual concepts. Now, it at least a prima facie reason to doubt of this claim is that um, whereas Leibniz is very explicit in endorsing innatism, Kant is quite vocal in denying that he is an innatist. In fact, he even uh, puts forward three arguments against innatism. So I will now move on to the final section of my paper and I will look at those arguments in order to uh, argue that actually those arguments are not best seen as arguments against innatism in general. And in particular, they don't work if they are uh, used against the particular kind, the particular form of innatism that I'm ascribing to Kant. Those arguments are best understood as arguments that go against a different form of innatism, Crusoe's form of innatism that Kant explicitly rejects. Um, the arguments are three. There are the lazy reason argument, the non-necessity argument, and the slippery slope argument. Let's start from the lazy reason argument, which can be found in various texts from the 1770s to 
through the early 80s. So the period in which Kant was writing the Critique of Reason and immediately after he published it. Now these texts, on the face of it, uh, employ the lazy reason argument against a variety of different targets. The admission of editing, so presumably any representation as an aim, the admission of an aim concepts of space and time in the inaugural dissertation, Crucius's ready-made concepts, or quote, uncreated and unborn concepts. Again, again with reference to Crucius. Uh, all these texts uh, reject in a case on a methodological ground. And the ground is, quote, one must remain within nature as long as it is possible without appealing to God to trade away, end quote. Now this sentence has two implications. The first is that in order to explain the origin of concepts, in inner tastes must appeal to God. And not by chance, the expositions of the lazy reason argument mention Crucius, for whom God has planted innate ideas into our mind. And Crucius is very explicit on God's role in planting the seeds of innate ideas <coughs> into our mind. Now, the second implication of the statement that one must remain within nature as long as it is possible without appealing to God is that it is possible to explain the origin of concepts while remaining within nature without appealing to God. So how does the argument work? I think it works as follows. Premise one. In order to explain the origin of ideas, inner theists must claim that God has planted innate ideas into our mind. Second premise. But this is methodologically unsound. And conclusion, therefore, we must reject the case. Now, why is it methodologically unsound to claim that God has planted innate ideas into our mind? Because, quote, is the passage that I quoted just a minute ago, one must remain within nature as long as it is possible without appealing to God straight away. End quote. In other words, the claim that God has planted innate ideas into our mind is a supernatural explanation, but we should reject supernatural explanations as long as natural explanations are available. Now, we can provide a natural explanation for the origin of concepts, therefore we must reject the claim that God has planted innate concepts into our mind. Now, this argument, however, is not compelling against innatism as such, because innatists need not make any claims about God. They can provide naturalistic, so evolutionary explanations for innate ideas, for instance. And indeed, uh, Chomsky and his followers often stress that their innatism is an empirical and therefore naturalistically respectable hypothesis. So, the lazy reason, lazy reason argument only prevents them from embracing innatism if they embrace it together with theological claims, with claims about God. As Leibniz did uh, when he portrayed God as the person who synchronized the physical and the mental order and who set up the to establish harmony, and as Crucius did when he claimed that God has planted the seeds of our ideas in our mind. But Kant does not embrace innatism in conjunction with theological claims, with claims about God. Um, at least if the account of the formation of the categories that I provided earlier is Kant's actual view. But then Kant's innatism is immune from the laser reason argument. Okay, let's turn to Kant's second argument against innatism the non-necessity argument. Now, in the case of the first argument, I had to go at some length in order to explain that it actually only addresses a theological form of innotation. Uh, now, uh, in the case of the non-necessity argument, uh, this is really quite apparent. Uh, Kant uses the non-necessity argument against what he calls the preformation hypothesis or the preformation system. And this is the view that the categories are, quote, 
subjective predisposition for thinking implanted in us along with our existence by our author, by God, in such a way that their views would agree exactly with the laws of nature along which experience runs, a kind of performation system of pure reason. End quote. So uh, how is Kant arguing here? He's arguing in this way. Premise one. If we adopted innatism to explain the agreement of the categories with experience, we would uh, lose the necessity of the categories, which presumably means the necessity for experience to agree with the categories, to exemplify the categories, to exhibit causes, substances to us, and so on. So for instance, quote, I wouldn't be able to say that the fact is combined with the cause in the object, at E necessarily, but only that I am constituted so that I cannot think of this representation otherwise than as so connected." And so, so if we adopted innatism to explain the agreement of the categories with experience, we would lose the necessity of the categories. But the categories are necessary, Therefore, we cannot explain the agreement of the categories with the experience by means of innatism. Now, Kant puts forward the, this argument against a as an argument against a specific form of innatism, as I mentioned, the performation hypothesis. But what I'm really interested in is whether this argument can be used against innatism in general, and in particular against the innatism <coughs> that I am ascribing to Kant. And I will now argue that it can't be used in that way. So if Kant's arguments in the transcendental deduction are successful, then he can be an innatist without losing the necessity of the categories. Let's consider the second version of the transcendental deduction, the 1787 version. Now, there, Kant provides an extended argument for the necessity of the categories. Uh, and that argument depends on a link that Kant establishes between the forms of judgments and the categories. Kant claims that whenever we make judgments with a certain form, say subject predicate judgments, we must apply a certain category, the category of substance in the case of subject predicate judgments. He concludes that since our experience is inextricably related to our uh, to the possibility of formulating judgment, then our experience is also inextricably related with the categories. So whenever there is judgment, there, is, there are categories. Whenever there is experience, there is judgment. Therefore, whenever there is experience, there are categories. The question is, does this require the categories to be acquired? Or does it require the categories to be innate? Well, I don't think it requires any. So the argument would work equally well, or if you want, equally badly, if the categories were innate, as if the categories were acquired. So all that the argument requires is for the categories to be inextricably related to our capacity of, for judgment, so that whenever we judge, we apply the categories, regardless of the origin <coughs> of the categories. They might be innate, they might have been implanted into our mind by brain surgery. It doesn't matter. The argument works nevertheless. Now, if this is correct, then Kant can be a innatist without losing the necessity of the categories. So the non-necessity argument claims that um, innatism rejects, uh, innatism entails losing the necessity of the categories, the necessity that the categories are exemplified in experience. But if the argument of the transcendental deduction works, and it does not require Kant to be an innatist, then Kant can be an innatist uh, even without losing the necessity of the categories. So why does Kant formulate the non-necessity <coughs> argument? Now, unfortunately, uh, John Callanan has sorted out this question, and he has shown that, uh, for Kant, those people who 
commit the mistake of losing the necessity of the categories of Latin and Crucius, because they rely on these flimsy theological assumptions that Kant doesn't like, instead of relying on, well, on the argument that Kant himself sparks out in the transcendental deduction. So I conclude that the non-necessity argument can be successful in um, directed against the particular versions of innatism of Leibniz and of Crucius, theologically motivated versions of innatism, but it's not successful against innatism as such. Okay, I have that with the laser vision argument and with the non-necessity argument. Let me look at the last argument, the slippery slope argument. Now, this is a very brief argument that really just um, formulates it as an incidental remark when he is discussing other things. He writes that if one grants innatism with regard to the intellectual concepts, to the categories, then, quote, no end can be seen to how far one might drive the presupposition of predetermined dispositions for future judgments, end quote. So if one grants innatism with regard to the categories, then we cannot draw a line and all other concepts will turn out to be innate as well. Hence, the slippery slope. Now, Kant doesn't mention any concepts, uh, sorry, any philosophers in this passage where he briefly formulates this argument. But uh, here again, I can rely on prior scholarship. Michael Oberhausen has argued that the argument appears to be directed once again against Crucius. But Leibniz too had that uh, all our future judgments are driven by the determined disposition, so Kant could have directed the argument against Leibniz as well. Yet, he see Kant, it is not true that innatists cannot draw a line between innate and acquired concepts. They can admit that some concepts are innate without granting that all other concepts will be innate as well. Um, so how can they do that? Well, they can just follow Kant's own policy for isolating intellectual concepts. Kant uh, claims that if the content of a concept is such that we cannot derive it from sensory stimuli, then that concept must be an intellectual concept. He explains this at the beginning in the introduction to the critique of pure reason that he claims that we have some a priori concepts, the categories, and that we must explain their origin. He says, look, uh, take experience. Uh, will you be able to point out in the science data and the sensory stimuli anything that is a substance? Well, you will be able to point out to identify stimuli of red or yellow or heat, but you will not be able to identify the sensory stimulus of substance or of cause. So this must mean that substance and cause must be not a posteriori concepts, but they must be a priori concepts. Now, one can use exactly this very same argument in order to distinguish innate concepts from non-innate concepts. The genetist can say, take any specific concept, and if we can explain how it derives its content from sensory stimuli, then it will not be innate. If you cannot explain this, then it must be innate. So there is no slippery slope here. Uh, it is possible to separate innate from non-innate concepts for an innatist. Uh, so if this is correct, then the slippery slope argument, exactly like the relative reason argument and the non-necessity argument, fails against an argument against innatism in general, and it fails as an argument against Kant's particular form of innatism. Okay, so let, let us take stock. So far, I have argued that given two widespread notions of innatism, of innateness, Kant is an innatist, uh, regarding intellectual concepts, and have tried to show that his views on the origin of those concepts are remarkably similar to Leibniz's. 
the way in which we form them is pretty much the same, both for Kant and for Leibniz. I have also tried to show that Kant's arguments against innatism don't work against innatism in general, and in particular, they don't work against Kant's specific form of innatism. Um, they only work, and hence they're best seen, as arguments attacking a specific kind of innatism. <coughs> um, Crucius's performationism that Kant rejects because of these theological commitments that Kant does not like. Now, if all of this is correct, then we are left wondering why Kant denies that he's a dynatist, why he classes Leibniz, who holds pretty much the same view as he does concerning the origin of the categories, in the camp of the bad, wrong dynatists, along with Plato, and now, there are two possible explanations that I can think for this. One is this. Um, Kant did not regard this position of innatism as a true, as a real form of innatism. He thought that the real innatism is the view of those people who claim that concepts are entirely formed in our mind since our birth, and not just the dispositions are there from, since our birth. So on this reading, Kant uh, maintained that innatists should take concepts to be at least partially formed since birth. And he rejected Crucius and Leibniz's innatism because he thought that both for Leibniz and for Crucius, concepts are at least partially formed in our mind since our birth. Now, this is problematic because if what I have said earlier is correct, then Leibniz does not hold this view. He doesn't claim that concepts are there fully formed in our mind since our birth, but he claims that they're only there since our birth uh, in a dispositional form. Now, Kant might have missed this. After all, uh, not many people were reading the New Atheists carefully in the 1660s and 70s, and so no surprise if Kant did not read the New Atheists carefully either. But, uh, Kant claims that Crucius is an innatist as well, and if we look at Crucius's works, which Kant certainly did, at least for some portions of them which he knew very well, and Crucius is very explicit that he endorses a dispositional form of innatism. He only claims that God has placed the seeds of, the con of our concepts in our minds. He doesn't claim that God has given us fully formed concepts since the moment we were born. So is it possible that Kant failed to notice this? Well, maybe it is possible. Kant didn't have a great interest in the history of philosophy. He's often sloppy in his historical statements. So for instance, when he mentions prior innatists, he doesn't mention Descartes, he doesn't mention Cadwell, he doesn't mention Harry Moore. It could be that he never looked carefully at the history of innatism, and maybe that he didn't read carefully Crucius' passages of innatism, and so he didn't realize that Crucius was a disposition of innatist. It's also well uh, possible that Kant never read very carefully the new essays. There are good reasons to think that he did read them, but he mentions just Leibniz's innatism, even less than Crucius' innatism. So really quite little. Even in his lectures, in his unpublished notes, the reflexion. So if he paid so little attention to Leibniz and to Crucius's views, then maybe he really failed to notice that Leibniz and Crucius were dispositional in at least. It is possible. Now, there is another explanation that I quite prefer to this pre uh, first explanation. And it is that Kant did not regard himself as an innatist because he did not identify innatism as we normally do, and as I did in this paper, with a specific thesis concerning conceptual origin. He thought of innatism as this world epistemological and metaphysical package deal that includes specific claims on the origin of our concepts, yes, but also a metaphysical commitment to God as the source and the guarantor of 
our ideas and of their agreement with the experience. And God clearly didn't like this theological intrusion into philosophy. So perhaps he thought of innatism as this theologically motivated package deal. He doesn't like the theological component of it, therefore he rejects innatism considered as with this big uh, fat theory. Now, what can we say in favor of this second explanation? Well, Kant usually trusts Plato, Leibniz, and Crucius as innatists. In one to Pythagoras, Pythagoras as well, but really not that often. And in his view, all of these authors were committed to this view of God as the person who provides a guarantee for the agreement of our innate ideas with experience. So they all bought into this theological, theological motivated package here. So that is a a reason to think that perhaps Kant really had this big theological metaphysical package deal in mind when he was thinking of innatism. Another reason is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of Kant's texts direct the lazy reason argument against uh, innatism as such. But <coughs> this would hardly be justified unless Kant's thought that innatism involves a commitment to a supernatural being. This is because the lazy reason argument claims that one um, must remain within nature without appealing to God straight away, but if innatism can be upheld without reference to God, then the argument does not get off the ground. So perhaps the underpinning for this argument is that Kant was already thinking of innatism as a theological or partly theological view. And then there are a number of statements that Kant makes in various texts. He uh, associates innatism or its modern versions with theological commitments. So for instance, he claims that one, he writes at one point, if they, cognitions, are inborn, then they are revelations. Well, revelation is a theological term. And in his lectures on metaphysics, um, or at least the transcripts of his lectures on metaphysics, uh, state, quote, recently it was said that they, ideas, are innate. It was held that God has placed certain fundamental concepts in every human soul. So again, we find a link between innatism and God. So let me summarize. It is possible that Kant regarded Leibniz but not himself as an innatist because he did not regard this positional innatism as a true form of innatism and he misunderstood Leibniz's and Crusoe's positions uh, by not noticing that they too were these positional innatists. Uh, however, I think that there is a stronger evidence for a different view, which is the view that Kant took innatism to include an acceptable theological commitment. And he denied that he was an innatist to distance himself from the theological commitments of earlier innatists like Leibniz and like Crucius. So my conclusion is that once we separate innatism from those commitments, then it becomes much easier to appreciate the two points that I've tried to make in this paper, which are, first of all, the point that Kant no less than Leibniz is an innatist. In fact, is an innatist with views that are very similar to Leibniz's own innatist view. And uh, the second point is precisely that Leibniz's views, that Kant's views are much more similar to Leibniz's than has often been acknowledged and that Kant himself acknowledges. Sure. Thanks for your attention. So, yeah, thank you very much for this. I was an interesting and compelling uh, presentation. Um, two points I would like to, to discuss with you. The first would be that uh, I think I have a kindly a third reason why Kant possibly missed uh, the target. 
at least in the case of uh, Leibniz. I don't know about why he needs the target in the case of Cruz. Uh, namely, like most of one possible explanation would be that like most of his contemporaries, I think he knew Leibniz through Wolf and Wolfian philosophy. I don't know exactly how the case in Wolf's situation, but in respect with Leibniz, I agree with you that if we take um, inactivism in this respect as being a disposition to form concepts, yes, Leibniz and Kant <coughs> are on the same side. And now the second point. However, but I think that in Leibniz uh, there are some passages, uh, I have to check them out. Uh, again, but at least uh, in Theodicy, for example, he uh, is claiming or at least suggesting that somehow the concept of God is innate. I mean the concept per se, not the faculty to form the concept of God, which in this respect uh, raise these some uh, problems to your argument and also put some distance between uh, Leibniz and, uh, and Kant. But otherwise, yes, I think what you presented is excellent. Uh, um, so as to the first part, uh, Leibniz and Kant, yes, I, I agree that Kant knew Leibniz through both and that on a number of occasions he might um, be thinking that he's, for instance, in the amphiboly of the concepts of reflection. He might be thinking that he's attacking, attacking Leibniz, but actually Leibniz was on Kant's side at the end of both, uh, a bit ironically. Uh, in this case, however, mm, I would resist using this as an explanation for Kant's misunderstanding, because if we look at both texts, both in the German metaphysics and in the American and to the German metaphysics, then they are too both in those as dispositional in activism. So again, what can I say about this? I would be tempted to make the same point that I've made before, that Kant is a sloppy reader of the history of philosophy, and even though he praised Wolf on a number of occasions, well, at least he, he cannot have read those passages very carefully, maybe. I do think that there is some reason to suspect that Kant would write the new essays. There might not be the strongest reasons, but let me run them past you and then uh, I'll share what I think. Um, now, there are some comments on Leibniz's theory of cognitions that appear in Kant notes around 1770. The new essays had been published in 1765. Could this be a merely indirect and direct influence? Well, we don't know, but what we know, because Giorgio Tonali has proven it, is that the new answers had very little influence on Kant's peers. So perhaps this appearance of a few comments on Leibniz's theory of cognition around 1770 are due to the fact that Kant actually read the thing, at least in part. Now, it's probably not a very strong argument by itself, but there is a second point. Uh, Marcus Hart, who was uh, Kant's scholar and who was the respondent at the defense of the inaugural dissertation, he wrote a paraphrase of the Mundi of the 1770 dissertation. So in order for Kant to get his, um, his position, he wrote uh, the Mundi's intelligences and sensibilities for that in keepings, and then there was a defense. But it was not Kant who was defending the work, it was Marcus Hart. So uh, Kant must have carefully instructed Hart and taught him what to say in the defense. And then Hart went on to publish a paraphrase of the Mundi in German. Die Betrachtungen über spekulative Wahrheit. And there, uh, Hart relates Kant's views on the origin of the representations of space and time to Leibniz's views. Now, it's not Kant's views on the categories, but still it's close enough, I would say. And why did he do that? 
Well, probably because Kant told him or instructed him um, on the content of the Bundi. So this might mean that it was Kant himself who was relating his own views to Leibniz's views, perhaps. But if he does so, then Kant had read the Nuances because he refers to the Nuances. Now, I realize that these two might not be very well strong as a, as a part. Now, there is a third part that might be slightly stronger, and that is that the transcripts of Kant's lectures from between 1777 and 1785, so around the time of the critique of pure reason, state that Leibniz was a disciple of Plato, whereas Locke was a disciple of Aristotle. Now, what is the source for this statement? It is not false because um, both only contrasts Plato's inatism with Aristotle and Locke's views, but he doesn't mention Leibniz. The claim that I am a disciple of Plato, whereas Locke is a disciple of Aristotle, is the claim that we find in the preface of the New Races. So maybe in that statement is a sign of the fact that Leibniz had read the New Races. I don't know how strong this, these arguments are, but it's all that I have been able to come up with. So if you have any thoughts, please, please, let me know. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. Mm. Maybe in the, in the last um, argument, um, the thing that Bob doesn't mention explicitly, right, it's there. It's at least an indication, but somehow maybe he's thought of Leibniz. I don't know what. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, the second question was uh, regarding the concept of God in Leibniz, whether it is made in the wrong sense, in the theory. Well, the short answer is I don't know. I better check with theodicy carefully. Um, if you have mine specific no, no, I have to check as well as I said. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll okay. check it. Uh, now, there is another potential problem, which is the metaphor of the block of marble, right? If our concepts are innate in our mind, like the block of marble is, like the statue is innate in the block of marble, well, the statue is there in the block of marble from the beginning. There is not just the disposition to form the statue that is there in the block of marble. So this is a very different kind of metaphor from the metaphor of the seed, that is the one that I was exploiting in the data. Well, what can we do? We have statement, uh, passages by Leibniz that put in different directions. So the way I deal with this is suggesting that the Leibniz's official view is that the intellectual concepts are innate in us as dispositions because that is what he states more explicitly. And then it's best to make, try and make sense of the metaphor of block of marble in dispositional terms of, if we want, or to say, well, it's just a metaphor after all, and to take the more explicit statement that the intellectual concepts are innate in us as dispositions at state value because, at face value because, well, that is not just a metaphor, it is more explicit. I realize that there is a tension in Leibniz's processes here and Leibniz's views and that does not entirely square with my argument. So probably should mm -hmm. I should look into this more carefully. But thanks. Julian. All right. So uh, I have a, a couple of small points to make about um, this view that you call dispositional mm -hmm. innateism. So So um, so I think it's not, the, the view is not free of any theological assumptions, right? As you seem to uh, think, maybe. Because one could say, well, even if God doesn't put any innate ideas in our minds, he does put these innate dispositions. Uh, and nobody would probably uh, dispute that. Uh, so I wonder who fails to be a, a, um, a dispositional innateist on this view? Even law could be one, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I see the usefulness of uh, introducing the view to characterize uh, Kant's view. 
but but perhaps I mean this is just a small just a small thing. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure there's uh, good answers uh, to this. What worries me, on the other hand, is um, what you said about categories as being um, innate in a derivative sense. Right. So you said. Uh, the categories are dispositionally innate because dispositions are innate. The dispositions to form the faculties and the, and the, right, the um, capacities yeah. are innate. Okay? Yeah. So categories are derivatively innate. And as you noted, and I think that's right, on this view even empirical concepts would be innate because they also presume dispositions to form them. But you said then, well, Kant doesn't agree to this because he says, well, in order for you to form empirical concepts, you need, you, you presuppose, you need a category. So otherwise, you won't be able to form empirical concepts. Right? But that doesn't mean that empirical concepts are not, are not innate. It just shows that their, perhaps their innateness is doubly derivative. They would still come out as innate. Right? So I think this is a bigger problem, which you perhaps need to uh, think about. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the both points. Uh, so for the first one, well, Kant could well say that God has placed these positions in our minds. After all, um, where would our nature derived from is, if not from God, according to Kant. Uh, so, yes, he, maybe he would have stated that if he had been pushed really hard. However, uh, Kant claims that from a theoretical point of view, at least, we cannot know uh, whether this is the case, that whether it is the case that God has placed the dispositions in our minds because God lies beyond the reach of our cognition, we can have any theoretical knowledge of God. And there is one passage in the Critique of Pure Reason when uh, Kant says, well, if you ask me why we have these and not another set of categories, then I just answer, we don't know the answer lies beyond our wish. So maybe he could say the same about the suggestion that it is God has placed these heats or these positions of the categories in our mind. And I think this would get him off the hook, at least based on his official assumptions. Unless, of course, we reject his agnosticism regarding God, but then I mean, we would be going beyond that. I think the second point is uh, more worrying. Now, Kant can certainly claim that empirical concepts are not innate, unlike um, the categories in the input-output sense. So in the case of the categories, we derive their content from reflection on the operations of our mind, which is something that is in us. We don't derive the content from sensory stimuli. Whereas in the case of empirical concepts, we derive the content from sensations. So he could still say, well, the categories are still innate, unlike, in, in, unlike empirical concepts in the input-output sense. But the point about this positional innatism, yeah, that is more worrying. He might have to agree that empirical concepts are dispositional innate. And, um, he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to claim that empirical concepts are dispositional innate. So certainly he could claim that dispositional innateness is not trivial because we have a differential disposition for prior the concepts, the categories but not empirical concepts. But that doesn't mean that empirical concepts are not dispositional innate. It's worth pointing out. So it looks like there is a problem there. Now, Kant might um, we perhaps reply by using the strong theological notion of innatism and say, well, I'm not an innatism, an innatist because 
in the case is this theological package deal, and I don't want to make any assumptions on the theological side of things. But it, it, I think it still strikes me as true that given a narrow or more technical notion of dispositional innatism, then Kant will turn out to be an innatist regarding empirical concepts as well, and that is not something that Kant would grant. So it looks like I have a problem there, and I need to think about it. Um, yeah, so um, you show uh, if the Renatism is so similar, I don't see very well how Leibniz can arrive at the conclusion that all future judgments are predetermined dispositions, while Kant denies it. So you showed us the similarity, but what is the difference that makes them to arrive at such different conclusions? And also, uh, um, why aren't ideas of reason innate in this predisposition in this disposition of sense? I mean, are they or aren't they? So I start from the side of it. I think they are, or can't. Um, I don't think, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a guess. I mean, Kant doesn't say a lot on the formation of the categories. And uh, he says even less on the formation of the ideas of reason as far as I can tell. Um, what I think we can do is, in the same way in which we can read the derivation of the categories from the logical forms of judgment as a description, not just a justification of the legitimacy of the use of the categories, but also as a providing at least hints as to how we form the categories from the forms of judgments. In the same way, it looks like we can read the statements on the genesis of the ideas of reason at the beginning of the transcendental dialectic as describing the a priori non-empirical process in which we form the ideas of reason from innate dispositions. So I think it should be possible to do that. I've not looked at it in a lot of detail. But yeah, I think he would be in a test with regard to the ideas of reason. So what about space and time? Same thing, except that they're not concepts, but they are intuitions. I mean, broadly, but same do they thing. need to be actualized, or they are the conditions of actualizing? I mean, they don't need oh, something okay. empirical to be triggered, that's for sure. Oh, okay, space and time, I think, would be more complex then, because Kant has these nice statements in, in the text of anthropology on which he claims, for instance, that um, in order to have experience, we need to be able to track objects, but in order to track objects, we need to be at least three or four months old. And so, presumably, uh, infants under three or four months old, they only have that very simple form of experience that can sometimes characterize us as Varnemun when he speaks of the progress from Varnemun to Erfari. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, due to the development of their physical as well as mental capacities, they start having this thicker kind of experience, which is the experience that employs the categories. So there is a actualization of the dispositions that leads them to go from the seeds of the categories to the fully blown categories. Now, I don't think if I don't know if Kant could say the same with space and time because even that very simple basic form of experience that um, infants have must be experience of objects in a weak sense or appearances as if in space and time. So I don't know that there might be a disanalogy between space and time to be a date in a even stronger, stronger sense, sense than uh, the dispositional one. So for Kant, we have this innate capacity when we get stimuli sensations, we have this innate capacity to, so to say, locate them in a three-dimensional scenario so as to form mental not just images, but mental representations of things. 
and that is the capacity to give spatial and temporal structure to our sensations so as to go from sensations to intuitions which are spatially temporal spatial temporal structure but then what about the scenario itself maybe that representation that we need a representation of space and time in order to locate anything within it so maybe it is innate in a stronger sense could be it looks like the safe choice for the purpose of this paper is to ex very explicitly focus on the categories without getting entangled into these issues among space and time on the one hand ideas on the other but the other I think they're interesting, especially the point about space and time. Yes. Um, I was thinking that I might generalize what they say about the categories to intuitions and ideas, but looks like the um, the thing would be more complicated than than I assume. And the other point regards why Leibniz claims that. Um, so if they are so similar, how? Uh, that they reach such different conclusions. There must be something that differentiates them. Yeah. And it is sense. the sentence about future predictions? Uh, yes, so... Uh, oh. Is it uh, page four? Yes, so the thing that having a very similar in Kant, Kant, Leibniz reaches the conclusion that all future judgment express the predetermined disposition. Now, I think there is a disanalogy between Kant and Leibniz that perhaps might contribute to, to answer your question. I'm not sure, but I'll try. So Leibniz, at least on some readings, uh, Leibniz thinks that our mental lives are multi-layered, right? So we have the layer of our conscious experience. We have the, level, the, the layer underneath it of uh, those seats and dispositions and according to Nicholas Jolly for instance we have yet another layer which provides the basis for the disposition and the basis for those dispositions are small perceptions uh, I don't now what is the basis for the dispositions according to Kant for those faculties and capacities from which the categories derive. Well, I have no idea. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any case where Kant might discuss that. I even wonder whether Kant claims, whether Kant thinks that all dispositions have a basis in the same way in which all that means those dispositions might have small perceptions at the basis. Does Kant hold in his metaphysics that dispositional properties are rooted in categorical properties? Does he think that there are bare dispositions? I know of one colleague who claims that for Kant there are bare dispositions, but frankly I have no idea what Kant's metaphysical outlook is there. So Leibniz thinks that all of our mental lives are ultimately rooted in small perceptions, at least on some readings, and that Anything that we experience is the unfolding of this unconscious um, seeds or unconscious mental contents that we have. Um, Kant doesn't make those claims, so he's free to to hold a different view about, about the development of our mental lives. I suppose. Does this help? I also have a question uh, about the lazy reasoning argument. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, what happens if uh, one introduces uh, the discussion about uh, the fall uh, mm, into the picture? Because that seems to be uh, mm, mm, a much more complex argument that goes out uh, in, uh, from a theological position. Uh, so, is there any change in the argument? I don't know. 
so how would we how, how could we could insert the fall into the picture so I'm just trying to think how you could go so God has planted in it that he has into our mind now maybe I don't know if it is a relevant point but um, I'm not aware that Kant uh, mm, discusses those uh, those issues that derive from the view that we have our minds have been corrupted somehow by the fall. He just doesn't seem to go with that kind of argument. So I'm not aware of places where he discusses them. So maybe it's just that he didn't share that out there. He got up to the worried about that kind of issues. But I don't know if if that is much of an answer. questions uh, or remarks, we can uh, move this to a more informal discussion. Uh, but before that, uh, let's thank again uh, to Alberto.